Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Starting Small, a podcast about brand development, entrepreneurship, and innovation in the modern world. In this episode, I'm joined by Greg Sugar, founder of The Thai Bar. Greg started The Thai Bar in his basement and eventually grew to over $19 million in annual revenue. In 2019, Greg acquired Bose Ties of Vermont, where he now operates full-time as CEO. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Starting Small. Today, I'm joined by Greg Sugar of The Thai Bar and Bose Ties. Greg, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks. Mm-hmm. So I want to start out with your upbringing. So where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? Well, I was born and raised in Miami Beach, Florida. Um, and, you know, Miami Beach was not what you think of it is right now. There mm-hmm. was uh, no South Beach. There were no uh, crazy clubs. It was actually more like small town America. And mm-hmm. uh, so I grew up there. Um my whole childhood, you know, same house, that whole thing. Uh, eventually went away to college in Indiana. I was one of these kids, I think, that wanted a fresh start in life. Didn't go yeah. to University of Florida like a lot of kids at my school did, my high school. Um, and so really, for me, I sort of, uh, my, the second chapter of my life started when I went away to Indiana University. Gotcha. Growing up, did you have an entrepreneurship mindset, say, sell any products or start any other companies prior to Indiana? Uh you know, it, no, I I don't have anything that's really tangible. Yeah. Uh, but in hindsight, I always noticed that um, whatever I did, I always wanted to uh, get better and do better in the way that I I wanted things to be my own. And I'm sort of fast forwarding to when I was a lawyer. I was a and I don't want to get too ahead of my story, but <laughs> when I was a lawyer, I was more focused on clients than practicing sure. law. And so that's really, I think, when I first started to feel. Um, some of my entrepreneurship kick in. But I think as a kid, I I guess I really didn't have any instincts back then as far as I can tell. Gotcha. So you went to Indiana University in 1990. And then what did you study there? Uh, the telecommunications. Okay. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to be in TV production. Uh, college for me was really more about uh, discovering myself socially. I was a, an invert in high school. I was, I was a much different person. I went to college and sort of found myself on a much more personal and social level. And mm-hmm. academically, I sort of blew it off. Yeah. So what was your overall experience like there? Were you involved with any clubs or athletics, et cetera? Um, no, I mean, it was, I was in a fraternity and, okay. you know, did intramural stuff. Uh, I was really, like I said, I, I needed to figure myself out on a much more social level. So no, as far as like resume building at Indiana, no, it didn't have any, but I had a great time. Um, I came out of my shell and, you know, as you'll learn, you're, you know, you're a junior, but you'll learn Mm -hmm. in life that um, your social IQ really does matter a lot more than probably anything else in in business, especially. And so uh, I'm glad to say that I got, I sort of got my uh, start or my education socially in college that to this day has really helped me out. Yeah. So you went to graduate law school in 1998 and then in between this gap between Indiana and law school, were you working your television job or what were you doing during this time that progressed you to go this direction? Well, uh, well, you're really paying close attention to my LinkedIn profile. (laughs) Uh, I took a year off. I actually went to Atlanta by myself. Uh, Again, sort of like this, this, I went to college nonsense. I went to Atlanta by myself, um, tried to get a job in tv advertising whatever i only landed some kind of uh crappy job at the atlanta journal constitution which is a newspaper there doing auto automotive ads Mm. uh got paid nothing had a bartend at night to pay my bills that sort of thing and that's kind of what got me into law school was i was just i didn't necessarily want to be a lawyer i just didn't want to get paid thirteen thousand a year anymore (laughs) for sure that's kind of what pushed me into law school gotcha and then following law school and prior to founding the thai bar what kind? What kinds of jobs, and where were you working at this time? So during that time, I it was an eight. I had an eight-year legal career, mm-hmm. which t- to me is really giving it a, a fine chance. I, I practiced law. I worked my ass off. Um, did commercial litigation. Represented a lot of businesses, a lot of small businesses. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I sort of started figuring out that um, while practicing law and learning the law was important, getting clients was probably more important. For My sure. first, I, so I had four jobs in eight years, which should have been an indication that this wasn't the right thing for me. <laughs> but what was interesting was after my um, second job, 
I'd only been out of school three years at that point and I left and clients that I had worked with said they wanted me to keep being their lawyer and they wanted to join me at my next law firm. Mm -hmm. And that kind of surprised me because as a third year associate, talk to anyone three years out of law school will tell you they were, don't really have a book of business. Mm -hmm. But apparently I'd been working so hard on making real relationships with these clients that they felt very comfortable with me even as sort of a beginner lawyer and they came with me and, and, uh, and that's what happened over a period of eight years. I really built a, um, a real book of business of law that my, my entrepreneurship uh, uh, inclinations were showing. And, you know, when I ultimately walked away from the law years later, I, one of the things that was hard to do was to give up clients because it was a, it was a business. I, I basically walked away from one business yeah. to go into another. So the Thai bar was founded in 2004. And like you said, you had an eight year law span. So what inspired you to venture off from the attorney world and create the Thai bar then? Well, I was having breakfast one morning, my little two year old threw some cereal on my Thai. Uh, <laughs> I was getting ready for work. I was incredibly frustrated. I just bought this Thai for like 50 bucks at Macy's or Nordstrom. And uh, I was like, geez, I got to go get another tie. I was really frustrated that I had to pay so much for a tie. And so I, I did some quick, uh, I had a laptop. I quickly went on the internet and found what was a website, a website not many people knew back then, although everyone knows it now, called Alibaba. Okay. Alibaba, if you know it, is at its core, it's really meant to be almost like a broker, a broker where they're going to find you factories overseas and they match you up with. They, you know, they match you up with brokers overseas to help find you uh, a manufacturer to help manufacture your product. So yeah. I started asking some questions, sent some emails, and I soon found out how inexpensive it was to make ties and how the markup was absolutely obscene. So I thought, you know, I wonder if, you know, I could create my own brand that sells ties cheap. Now, in 2020, as I tell the story, it doesn't really sound like a very novel concept, <laughs> but that's because we live in a much different retail environment now and For customers sure. change. Your, your demographic and even the millennials a little older than you have always been a, about value. You guys want a, a value proposition anytime you buy anything. Mm -hmm. But my generation, Generation X, was not that way. We were happy to pay more money if we believed we were getting you know, luxury. Um, and we, we weren't looking for the cheapest thing. So I, so me saying, okay, let's come up with a tie company. It was really me and my wife. We're, let's charge 15 bucks for a tie and that's it. And that's full, that's full price. It's on a markdown price. It's 15 bucks all the time. And it was a bit of a novel concept. We were the first menswear brand to do that, to, to, uh, to be born on the internet. Um, and mm -hmm. so this direct to consumer, you know, get rid of the middleman type of concept, of course, Warby Parker and so many other brands have since made, made much more famous than we ever did. Uh, that's, that's how we got started. That's yeah. how I got my business started. And, and we ran it for a year. I did two jobs, you know, I'm like working as a lawyer during the day. I go to bed. I came home. I fed my kids. I worked all night um, doing the tie bar. I did that for a year. And after a year, the business had grown to a substantial enough size where I was able to finally quit the law. So I did both for a year. Gotcha. Um, so you were outsourcing through Alibaba at this time then for your ties and then selling those directly to consumer. So you no, were actually... Alibaba helped me find our first supplier. Gotcha. And that's, that's what opened the door to me finding out how, just how inexpensive it was to make ties. Ultimately I went to a, a trade show and met, what what was my second supplier and and ultimately my supplier until until I sold the business nine years later I found him at a trade show but mm. to get started I used Alibaba it's not it's not that you use Alibaba it's just they link yeah. you up you know they recommend totally it's almost like Amazon searching for factories for sure so how many design options did you offer from the the first year of the tie Our bar first, then yeah our first collection was sixty five tie sixty five designs I remember them showing up they were a hundred each. I remember them showing up in my garage, opening them up and thinking, God, these are ugly. <laughs> I, mean, I knew nothing about design. I was uh, too stupid to realize that neck, neckwear design, especially woven neckwear, was, you know, it's a real skill set. It's not like yeah. something you can just draw on a, on a piece of paper and send it to China and have it made. It's a lot more complicated than that. So they were really ugly ties. <laughs> um, and that's what we were stuck with. But it was 2004. Fashion and menswear wasn't what it 
kind of is now. It wasn't its own little cottage industry. And people buying on the internet, I think, had sort of lower expectations too. So sure. it was sort of, they were decent enough looking, I think, to sell on the internet in 2004, but we probably couldn't sell a single one today in 2020. <laughs> gotcha. So being a small business out of your home at this time, how would you advertise and spread the word on your new Thai brand then? So what I did was I, I actually contacted, um, uh, I, I did research on who was writing on fashion all over the internet or newspapers, you know, newspapers were mm-hmm. a thing in 2004. <laughs> and I was writing to these, you know, these reporters who were um, writing about style and fashion and basically emailing me, emailing them a pitch. Um, I sent, you know, hundreds uh, a day. And once in a while, someone would come to me and say, okay, we'll write an article about you. And so we got little ones here and there, here and there, here and there. And then uh, one day we got a phone call from the head of the fashion department of the Chicago Tribune. She had just written an article about whether you could tell the difference between $200 jeans and $300 and $30 jeans. Oh, wow. Because the premium denim uh, market was just getting started. So mm-hmm. I introduced our company. I said, we're based in Naperville, Illinois, which was a suburb. I said, listen, we're starting our own tie business, and we don't think anyone could tell the difference between our ties and a $200 tie. Now, at this point, we were probably on our third collection. I had start, started to pick up a little bit on neckwear design. I had hired somebody on the side to help us. So I sent her some ties. She, sent it to, she showed it to some guys who really couldn't tell the difference between our ties and more expensive ties. So she wrote this big article, and overnight, our company exploded. Wow. So the day before the article came out, we had nine orders, which back then was sort of the norm. Mm-hmm. And then the day the article came out, which was the next day, we had 206 orders. Wow. Uh, and the day after was 184, I think. And it never slowed down. And it was a month after that where uh, my wife looked at me and she said, you know, in the last 30 days, we've made more money as a Thai company than you ever had as a lawyer. <laughs> so she's like, why don't you quit and run the company full time? And that's what I did. Wow. So was that from that one PR release then? Yeah. Yes. The answer wow. is yes. It was from one PR piece. Now PR now is so much different than it was then. Yeah. So I don't think that's the sort of thing that can happen again, but it did have that's, that did happen to us. That's a true story. And it did launch our, our company. I mean, that article ended up getting picked up by like the Denver post, uh, an article, uh, a newspaper in the state of Maine, and it just catapulted us. And ultimately, like a couple of years later, we got a meeting with GQ and we ended oh, up with G- GQ for the first time. And that just, you know, opened the door to so many other things for us. So that article definitely gets credit for launching the tie bar. And the, the writer of that article, her name is Wendy Donahue. I'll never forget. I've yeah. written her letters thanking her. Um, even when we sold the business, I, I sent her another letter thanking her. She really was solely responsible for launching the tie bar from a company in, or a company, not even like a lemonade stand in someone's <laughs> basement into a real company, which ultimately had 55 employees when I sold it. Wow. That, that's amazing. So I was curious on this point, social media wasn't really as big as it is now back then, but Facebook was founded in 2004. So did you guys ever utilize Facebook for advertisement or was that not really used for brands at that time? No, I mean, in 2004, Facebook was still on colleges. No, I mean, we, we, so figure Facebook started to become mainstream in 08, 09, Mm -hmm. and we launched our Facebook page. And back then you could post something on your own Facebook page and every single one of your followers would see your post. That's how Facebook used to operate. Yeah. Now they've changed that considerably, as you may know, where they're only going to show about three to 6% of your own followers, your posts. So back Mm -hmm. then we had a huge traction and a really strong following because they got to see absolutely everything we posted. But Facebook ads, that part actually didn't even launch, I want to say until either, I I think it launched 2013, the year we sold. Okay. So my, you know, when I owned the company, we never once um, uh, used Facebook ads. In fact, we barely used Google. My last year, I think it was the most we ever spent in Google in a full year. And it was 40,000 for the entire year. Some kind of ridiculously low, low number, you know, for a company that was in the eight figures. Gotcha. Everything we ever got was really PR. That's how we got all of our business. Our customer acquisition was all PR, all word of mouth. Because buying it, you know, by 2013, our our ties were as great as they can be. I mean, they were 
multi-fabrications, like high-end designs. I mean, we really didn't know what we were doing by that point. And so we were, um, the word of mouth was amazing because we were still selling for $15. A company now sells ties, I don't know, 25, 35. I don't know what they did with it, but yeah. they don't sell it at 15 anymore. Back then, 15 bucks for these ties is like ridiculous. It had a wow factor. That's huge. And so word of mouth was very big for us. And we became, started to become like a really, an internet darling, you know, on talk, it wasn't around Miz and Maine wasn't around bowl and brand, all of these direct to consumer brands that we know now, none of them were around back then. Not, you know, even Warby was still in its early stages. So we were like this Cinderella story people love to talk about. So we got a ton of coverage back then. Gotcha. So with your time at the tie bar, were the ties $15 uniform across the whole board then the, the entire time? Totally. And in fact, like that's amazing. Our, our silk knit ties, they're expensive to make. I mean, the margins are not good. Yeah. We I remember having this talk with my wife, like, what do we price them at? I said, you know what? We're not going to make a lot of money on them, but let's just do 15. We're going to get like the double wow factor because silk knit ties are expensive to make. And they were in, and as a result, our competitors on silk knit ties were all the way up to 75, $85. So a $15 knit tie was especially a great deal. And, you know, GQ loved that. They put our knit ties on the cover of their magazine. They, they featured our knit ties so many times. And it was a great, you can't say lost leader because we didn't lose money on it. Yeah. But definitely our margins weren't as high. But yeah, every, the, the answer to your question, every single uh, necktie and bow tie was 15 bucks on our site, no matter what it was made of. And it was always silk or wool or cotton or linen. We never used man-made polyester or microfiber, some of that cheap shit. We yeah. always use the real stuff and um, it did great. That's awesome. So with your time at the Thai bar as well, were you selling strictly through e-commerce the entirety or did you ever make it into any retail or shops at this time? Yeah, we sold through some small specialty shops. We kind of did more like a specialty label for them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, toward the end though, uh, Nordstrom came calling and um, they reached out to us Said, I remember the buyer said, I'm tired of sitting in meetings and hearing your name come up. We want to <laughs> start to carry you. So Nordstrom started carrying us on their website. We did extremely well. Um, first it was holiday season, 2012, extremely well. Um, they reordered, we had great sales with them. And I believe to this day, Tybar still sells to Nordstrom. It's always been a strong brand. Gotcha. So I'm, I was curious on this, you departed in. 2013 and what was the reason for you to move on from the tie bar at this point if you're open to share yeah sure um I, it was probably near the end of 2012 i was looking at our financials mm -hmm. and we we had doubled every year for three years in a row um we were on pace to do almost 20 million in sales wow. we were on fire and i said okay now's the time to sell my wife yeah. looked at me like i was crazy uh, and my thought was, no, you sell a company when it's going up, not when it's going down. So we, we hired an investment banker. We dipped our toe in the water, met with some private equity groups, and it was an incredible experience. Everyone who met with us loved us. Our financials were beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, we were very, very, very profitable. And so, um, you know, we started getting offers and you know, <laughs> yeah. sometimes an offer looks pretty good and you're like, all right, maybe it's time to, to exit. And so that's what we did. I, I sold the business at age 40. Gotcha. So at the time of selling, what would you say separated the tie bar from your competitors at this point then? Well, we were, all, we were the only co company offering, you know, this value proposition that customers were starting to demand yeah. our main customer was millennials and they back then they were in their early mid 20s and they were pretty serious about demanding a deal and so there weren't a lot of brands that were delivering on that um, we were one of them we also made a real connection back then with our customers i used to run our facebook our marketing all that stuff and um we had real engagement with our customers and I, I, I handled it all myself and I use my mouth for better or for worse when I'm running the company. Yeah. And so I think people felt that, that genuine 
Um, I mean, we were a real brands. You know, my brand was me. I, you know, my wife and I ran it, but I ran the marketing, all that stuff. And, you know, the, the, the jokes and the snarkiness that came out in our Facebook posts or in our emails came from my mouth. And now it's like the thing to do. Everyone wants to be as snarky and cool as possible. For sure. Back then, everyone played it safe, you know, <laughs> 25% yeah. off sale. Like nobody did it. Back, but I was, and trust me, I offended people. People stopped shopping with us because they, they didn't like the way that our company spoke, which again was really just me. Yeah. Um, I was always monitoring co- co- um, um, customer service. I kind of would make jokes there. Anyway, people found there to be a real connection. And um, they did like, a, what is it called? A QR? Not a QR. They did some stu- a Q, Q study, whatever it is. I forget what they call it. Uh, <laughs> on the likability of your brand and the referability. And we were an 84. Oh, wow. And um, Apple, I think back then, was in a 77. Jeez. So um, it just goes to show you like how strong we were. I think it's called a Q score or Q rating. Yeah. Um, um, we were just, you know, our, our, our repeat customer business was insane. Um, I can't, I can't disclose those numbers, but yeah, for sure. The repeat business was absolutely amazing. Um, customers did not shop with us once. And so anyway, I don't know. It just, everything, that's part of the reason I sold it is everything went well. I mean, at some point shit's going to hit the fan. Mm-hmm. You're going to screw up. You're going to offend somebody too much. Like there's every company goes through problems. You can't be lucky forever. That's yeah. why I sold the business. Like, obviously, something was going to go wrong at some point. So let me get rid of it now. For sure. As, as a customer, I really respect that. Like, the intimacy and personality that you left with the tie bar. That's what customers look for. And as you mentioned, they used to be worried to do that back back then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I it struck a chord with people, for sure. And like I said, I mean, I offended people, no doubt. But I yeah. think the people who weren't offended looked at it and said... I like these guys. I like that they're trying to be a little bit different, a little irreverent, a l- make a connection with me on some more of a, a more of a personal level and talk to me like a person and not like a customer. Yeah, totally. So Greg, if you could share one piece of advice to an aspiring entrepreneur, what would that be? Maybe something you've learned or regret a longer way? Just anything. Well, I mean, so I teach a course down here at Florida Atlantic University. I teach an entrepreneurship boot camp. And one of the things I've always said is start with a niche. Don't try to get good at everything. Don't try to to be in every category. Choose one product and go with it. Become a master at it. Convince people that you know what you're doing better than anyone else who does it. Don't, um, and, and, and sort of pick an audience. Like don't try to be all things to all people. You're not, not everyone's going to like you. Mm -hmm. So pick a product, pick an audience and go with it. Now it's not to say that, Sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes you, I mean, the truth is that the tie bar was originally made for middle-aged men who were wearing, you know, or were going to work every day in a suit. That was who we thought we were. We ended up picking up steam with millennials, guys who wanted skinny ties and tie bars and pocket squares. We didn't expect that. That just happened. So instead yeah. of fighting it, we went with it. So I guess, you know, if you're asking me, there's one piece of advice. I don't know what the one piece is, but Go with a niche, um, and, uh, and and like I said, you know, go after an audience. And, and if it turns out what your first inclination was is wrong, um, go with the flow. Pivot if you have to. Don't don't be stubborn about it. For sure, Greg. Thank you so much for joining me. And to the listeners out there, make sure to read up on the tie bar at thetiebar.com and also Bose Ties of Vermont, which Greg acquired in 2019 at BoseTiesLTD.com, which is B-E-A-U TiesLTD.com. Yeah, Bowties Limited of Vermont. That's um, that they were a former competitor of ours, and uh, I, I acquired them about a year and a half ago. And we did a whole uh, brand overhaul. Right now, we are uh, we offer the largest selection of masks anywhere, but we also do matching masks with bow ties and neckties um, to really rejuvenate our business. We had laid off every employee um, it, when COVID started, and I'm happy to say we hired all 23 back. We just hired our awesome. ninth new employee on top of that. So we're really buzzing right now. And uh, check us out. Hopefully you'll see something you like. Hey, thank you for listening to this episode of Starting Small. If you would, leave a review on whatever platform you're listening on. Also, follow Starting Small Pod on social platforms to keep up to date on future guests.